It's good to be with you all this morning. In John chapter 16 and verses 13 and 14, Jesus says, Howbeit when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he shall guide you into all the truth. For he shall not speak from himself, but what things soever he shall hear, these shall he speak, and he shall declare unto you the things that are to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall take of mine, and shall declare it unto you. We need to understand the Holy Spirit's nature. For two reasons, to avoid error that raises false hopes concerning the Holy Spirit and what He does, and to have fellowship with Him. Are we guilty of mysticism when we talk about the Holy Spirit? We're very superstitious people. Is our idea of the Holy Spirit, uh, does it derive from superstition or does it derive from the facts that are stated in the Scriptures? And I'm afraid that a lot of times it comes from superstition from ideas that are imagined, that are not uh, true, that are not endorsed by the Holy Scriptures, by the inspired writings of the Apostles. We understand that the Holy Spirit is a divine person. He's a separate individual from God and Jesus, a member of the Godhead. He is not an it, but a he. He's not just a vague, impersonal force, as some people teach. He's not merely the mind, temper, or disposition of God. It, <clears throat> he is not the Bible, or the New Testament, or the Word of God. Some have equated Him simply with His work, that is, the Word of God. In fact, that is a figure of speech that is used of someone else, that, that is, the Word of God. In John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that hath been made. Well, who is He talking about? There? He's not talking about the Holy Spirit. Look at verse 14. It says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. John beareth witness of Him, and crieth, saying, This was He of whom I said, He that cometh after me is become before me, for He was before me, for of his fullness all received, and grace for grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No man has seen God at any time, the only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. The word that is spoken of in John chapter 1 and verse 1 is Jesus Christ, the one through whom grace and truth came. So we, we don't want to confuse Jesus with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not referred to as the Word. And the Word is Jesus only in a metaphor, only in a figure of speech. Now, the Holy Spirit is spoken of by Christ as a person. Jesus often speaks of God as His Father and prays to Him. And He speaks of the Holy Spirit and His relationship to Him in John 14 and verse 26. John 14 and verse 26, Jesus in speaking to the apostles says, But the Comforter, even the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things, and shall bring to your remembrance all that I have said unto you. Then in John chapter 15 and verse 26, it says, And when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall bear witness of me. And in the passage that we read just a second ago, John chapter 16 and verse 13, Howbeit, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he shall guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak from himself, but what things soever he shall hear, these shall he speak, and he shall declare unto you the things that are to come. So here is the Holy Spirit spoken of by Jesus as a separate individual. It's interesting to note that in the, the three passages that we've read, if you throw in verse uh, 14 in John 16 there as well, the Holy Spirit is referred to nine times as He. Not as an it, but He. This can only be used, this word, He, can only be used as a person, uh, uh, of a person. He's talking about a person, the Holy Spirit, a He. Now, He has the divine attributes of personality. He has a mind in Romans chapter 8. And verse 27, it says, And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Holy Spirit, 
the Holy Spirit has a separate mind, and it is with this mind that he inspired the writing of the New Testament. In Ephesians chapter 3, and verses 3 through 5, the Apostle Paul says, How that by revelation was made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote before in few words, whereby when ye read, ye can perceive my understanding in the mystery of Christ, which in other generations was not made known unto the sons of men, as it hath now been revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets in the Spirit. The Holy Spirit revealed the things that are written in the New Testament to the apostles. He has the power to uh, search and to seek out knowledge. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 10 it says, But unto us God revealed them through the Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. Well, the Holy Spirit searched, sought out the deep things of God. That implies an intelligence. But he also has volition. And that's just a simple way of saying that he has the power to choose and decide. Which he did many times. On Paul's missionary journeys, it was the Holy Spirit who guided him and decided where he was going to go. In Acts chapter 16 and verse 6, it says, And as they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been forbidden of the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia, and when they were come over against Mysia, they were assayed to go to Bithynia, and the Spirit of Jesus the Spirit of Jesus suffered them not. There's a reference to the Holy Spirit again, calling him the Spirit of Jesus. And he made a choice as to where Paul was going to go and where he was not going to go. Where he was going to preach and where he's not going to preach. And he planted in Paul's mind a dream, it says. And in verse 9, it says, And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There was a man of Macedonia standing, beseeching him, and saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. Well, who put that dream or that vision in Paul's mind? The Holy Spirit did. The Holy Spirit was working on him to make choices as to where he would go and what he would do. Now, the Holy Spirit, as... <clears throat> We look at him as the power to love, as we see him described in the scriptures. In Romans 15 and verse 30, it says, Now I beseech you, brethren, by our Lord Jesus Christ, that, and by the love of the Spirit, that you strive together with me in your prayers to God for me. So here is the love of the Spirit, the Spirit's ability, his power to love us. The individuality of the Spirit is... Something that is made obvious to us when we read our text, the, the passage read at the beginning. John chapter 16 and verses 13 and 14. Again, he says, Howbeit when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he shall guide you into all the truth, for he shall not speak from himself. But what things soever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he shall declare unto you the things that are come. He shall glorify me, for he shall take of mine and shall declare it unto you. The Holy Spirit listens to the conversations between God and Jesus. He learns what he is supposed to tell, and he tells it. And this is something that can be done only as an individual. Since he is not the one who is speaking for himself, he must be speaking for somebody else. Now, <clears throat> there are other passages that we can look at to point out the individuality of the Holy Spirit. Uh, we want to consider at this time, at least for a moment or two, the influence of the Holy Spirit. Look at Acts chapter 1 and verse 6, where it says, They therefore, when they were come together, asked him, saying, Lord, dost thou at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Now this is the apostles asking Jesus a question of his ministry. Jesus was the king of the Jews. He was the king of kings and the Lord of lords. It was prophesied that he would come and restore Israel to its, its majesty and to its glory. But while he was here, he taught that his kingdom was not a physical kingdom, but rather a spiritual kingdom. And they were wanting to know when this kingdom was going to start, having, that is, a mind that it was still a physical kingdom. And so they asked him, do you do, you do this now? And he says uh, in verse 7, It is not for you to know the times of the seasons, which the Father had set with his own authority. But he, ye shall receive power when the Holy Spirit is come upon you. Ye shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. The, the, the sign for the beginning of the kingdom is the Holy Spirit coming upon them. And they were going to receive power. Well, when did that happen? That happened in Acts chapter 2 when they began to speak with tongues as the Holy Spirit gave them utterance. The Holy Spirit came upon them and influenced them. 
So the Holy Spirit has a certain amount of influence. In Acts chapter 6 and verse 3, in talking about selecting men to take care of the uh, needy uh, Grecian uh, widows, it talks about choosing men. Well, look at verse 3. Look ye out therefore, brethren, from among yourselves, seven men of good report, full of the Spirit. What's he talking about, full of the Spirit? He's talking about people who were influenced somehow by the Holy Spirit. There are other passages, of course, that talk about that. 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 14, it says, The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. The Holy Spirit has influence over us through the communion that we have with Him. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 18, it says there, Be not drunken with wine wherein is riot, but be filled with the Spirit. Don't be filled with wine, don't be influenced by the intoxicant of liquor, of alcohol, but be filled with the Spirit and let that be an influence, the deciding influence in your life. And finally in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 25 it says, If we live by the Spirit, by the Spirit let us also walk. In other words, allow the Spirit to have uh, the greater weight in the way that we live and do what He says. Follow His lead. Follow His teaching. Now, the Holy Spirit does not control in the sense that our choice is taken away. All of these passages have to do with our allowing the Spirit to have the influence over us, giving ourselves over to His teaching and to His guidance. Influence, then, is not a mystical force or power. It is not simply intuitive. That is, we sit down and we just think, and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit puts ideas or thoughts into our minds. It is much more clear than that. The influence of the Holy Spirit is seen in the black and white of the New Testament. Now, the abilities of the Spirit show His personality. In 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1, it talks about the Holy Spirit expressing Himself. It says there, But the Spirit saith expressly that in the latter times some shall fall away from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. The Holy Spirit tells us something. He speaks. He warns us. The Holy Spirit bears witness. In John chapter 15 and verse 26, it says, But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth which proceedeth from the Father, he shall bear witness of me. He shall bear witness of me. Who? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit makes intercession for us. This is a passage that is much misunderstood, but it's really quite simple. Romans chapter 8, verses 26 and 27. It says, and in like manner, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmity, for we know not how to pray as we ought. We don't know what all to say. We don't know what needs to be said. And so we do our best. But the Spirit himself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. In other words, the Holy Spirit knows better than we do what we need and what needs to be said. And so he says it for us. And he says it in ways that we cannot express ourselves, that we don't have the ability or the, the good sense to express ourselves. He says, And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he, that is the Holy Spirit, maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. The idea of making intercession is to speak for somebody. When uh, uh, Abraham prayed for the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. He prayed for their deliverance. If there should be ten righteous people in the city, he was making intercession for Sodom and Gomorrah. The Apostle Paul talks to the Philippians in Philippians chapter 1, praying that their love may increase in knowledge and discernment. Uh, he's praying for the people in Philippi, the Christians in Philippi, making intercession for them. The Holy Spirit makes intercession for us as well. We have lots of intercessors. We pray for you folks all the time that you would hear the gospel and obey it and come to know the, the happiness and the joy in Jesus Christ that we know. That is a prayer of intercession. But intercession requires three parties. It requires the person who needs the intercession, the one who does the interceding, and the one who is spoken to as the one who receives that intercession. And so when we talk of uh, the Holy Spirit making intercession, we see that he is a separate individual. He's not God, the Father, and he's not mankind, but he is one who comes in between them. The Holy Spirit is also said to search. In 
uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and beginning in verse 10, it says, But unto us God revealed them, that is, the things that, that He has prepared for us in the plan of salvation. But unto us God revealed them through the Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For whom men know the things of a man, save the Spirit of the man which is in him, even so the things of God none knoweth, save the Spirit of God. But the Spirit knows these things because He searches. If the Spirit was just a, a, a part of God, if He was just an adjunct to God's thinking, His mind, then He wouldn't have to search. But He searches. He studies the mind of God. And He knows what it is on account of that. The Spirit also forbids. We go back to Acts the 16th chapter, a verse that we read just a moment ago, verse 6 where it says, And they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been forbidden of the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. The Holy Spirit had it in his mind for Paul and, and Silas to go someplace else and not to waste time before they went. And so they went straight on to Macedonia, as it was revealed a little bit later, instead of the places where they intended to go originally. Why did they do that? Because the Holy Spirit move them in that direction. He forbade them to go to those places that are named. Now, there's another thing that the Holy Spirit does that is peculiar to individuals, and that is that He sorrows. In Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 30, Paul says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, in whom ye were sealed unto the day of redemption. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. When we fail to follow what the Holy Spirit has delivered in the Scriptures, we frustrate His purpose. On us, His efforts are wasted. And so this grieves Him. It makes Him sorrowful. And so we are told not to grieve the Holy Spirit, not to go against what He teaches. Now, the Holy Spirit, as uh, we have noticed in previous lessons, has fellowship with God in several things. First of all, he has fellowship with God in creation. In Genesis chapter 1 and verse 2, it says that the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. In other words, the Holy Spirit was present at creation. And in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26, God says, Let us make man in our image. And we've asked the question before, and we'll ask it again. Who is God talking to? Who is the us that is in, included in uh, this statement Genesis, of Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26? Who was it that God said in Genesis chapter 3 that man has become one of us to know good and evil? Who's the us? Who is the plurality there? Well, it's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All three involved in this creation. All three involved in the creation of man and all three sinned against when man sinned. Now, in the matter of salvation, the Holy Spirit has fellowship with God. And the first manifestation of that fellowship is in authority. In Matthew chapter 28 and verse 19, it says, Go ye therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. It is by the authority of all three, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, that we are to be baptized. I think this is an interesting passage. You know, in Acts chapter 11 and verse 26, Acts chapter 11 and verse 26, it talks about, the identity of Christians. Who are Christians? To whom is this name given? It says there in this passage, And when he had found them, he brought them into Antioch. Talking about Barnabas bringing Saul of Tarsus to Antioch to help him preach. And it came to pass that even for a whole year they were gathered together with the church and taught much people. And that the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. The word Christian applies to those who are disciples of Christ. Now, who is a disciple of Christ? In John chapter 8, in verses 31 and 32, that, the answer to that question is given, where it says, Jesus said to those Jews that had believed him, If you continue in my word, then are ye truly my disciples, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. But we are truly his disciples if we continue in his word. 
But the name Christian is given only to those who are true disciples. Now here's a question that, is, that arises. Where does that word come from? Where do we receive this word? From whom do we receive this word? Well, you look over at 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verses 16 and 17 where it says every scripture is inspired of God and is also profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for instruction which is in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, furnished completely unto every good work. That word that we are to continue in is the inspired word of God. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13, it says, For this cause we also thank God without ceasing, that when you received from us the word of the message, even the word of God, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which also worketh in you that believe. That which we find in the Bible is not the word of men, Rather, it is the Word of God. And it is inspired of God. But how does God inspire? Well, we look over at 1 Corinthians chapter 2, as we have done before. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and beginning in verse, verse 10, Paul says, But unto us God revealed them through the Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For who among men knoweth the things of a man, save the Spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, the things of God, none knoweth, save the Spirit of God. But we receive not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is from God, that we might know the things that were freely given to us of God. Which things also we speak, not in words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Spirit teacheth, combining spiritual things with spiritual words. Now, in this passage, it tells us where we get the word that we are to continue in to make us true disciples or real, genuine Christians. We get it from the Holy Spirit. God speaks to us through the Holy Spirit. Now, the, the question is, who is the us that he's talking about here in this passage that received the things of the Spirit of God? It's not Christians in general and certainly not the world in general. Look at Ephesians chapter 3. And verses 3 through 5. This gives the answer to who received these inspired teachings from God through the Holy Spirit. Paul says there, How that by revelation was made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote before in few words, whereby when ye read ye can perceive my understanding in the mystery of Christ, which in other generations was not made known unto the sons of men, as it has now been revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets in the Spirit. There were certain individuals to whom God revealed these things, but he revealed these things to them through the Spirit. And so the Spirit has a certain amount of authority in our salvation and what it takes to be saved. Now, we look back at Matthew 28 and verse 19 where he says, Go ye therefore and make disciples, make Christians. How do you do that? baptizing them into the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. If a person has not been baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, he's not a true Christian. He's not a true disciple. The Holy Spirit's authority rests in the fact that He is the one who revealed all this to us. That was His job. That was His mission. And so uh, we have the Holy Spirit and He is in fellowship with God in the matter of salvation. He knows God's mind and He reveals that mind to us. And so we are baptized into the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now the Holy Spirit is not just called the Holy Spirit. God and Jesus were given names that were appropriate for the time that described them properly. God is called Jehovah, which means I am. He's also called the Father, alluding to His creation and his position in the spiritual creation as well. He is the Lord. He is the Ancient of Days. Jesus is called by over 200 different descriptive phrases throughout the Bible. And that's way too many for us to name right now. We've mentioned the Son of Man. We've mentioned also the Son of God in, in previous lessons. But the Holy Spirit is given names as well. He's called the Spirit of God. He's called the Lord. Uh, the Spirit of the Lord. He's called the Spirit of Truth, the Spirit of Jehovah. All of these things refer to Him. He's called in John chapter 14 the Comforter or 
the paraclete or advocate. The word comforter is kind of misleading. It's almost like something you kind of hug and squeeze for comfort. But instead, what the Holy Spirit is, is He is an advocate. He's almost like our lawyer. He's a lawyer between us and God. He gives God's law to us and He pleads for our case before God and His throne. But anyway, that is what the Holy Spirit is called sometimes in the Scriptures. The Holy Ghost is something that He's called in the King James Version, but the change in the meaning of that word has led later translators to use the word Holy Spirit. He's not a ghost as we use the term ghost today, but ghost used to mean in King James' day just a spirit, one who was disembodied. Now the Holy Spirit has worked hard for our salvation. Don't quench the Spirit by rejecting Him or by being unfaithful. I want to thank you very much for listening this morning and want to invite you to come and worship with us at the 8th Street Church of Christ in Mesa, Arizona. Feel free to call and ask for Bible classes or any kind of information that we might be able to help you with. Thank you very much for listening this morning.